Well, good morning. We have a very active service this morning, haven't we? <laughs> a lot of different things going on. Well, it's great to be in the house of the Lord. It certainly is. If you need a Bible to follow along in this morning's message, uh, please slip up your hand. They'll make sure that you receive one. I just want to mention that uh, we do have a lot to pray for this week as we pray for the team going to Nicaragua and just pray for them as they have the opportunity to share Christ down there. And we look forward to uh, the opportunity to hear of, of some good fruit that comes of that. Also, uh, it's a great blessing to um, be able to, to just pray for these young people who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ this past week. That's, uh, that's wonderful as well. So remember to lift them up in prayer. Uh, you can lift the workers up as they recover this week. <laughs> I'm sure they'd appreciate that. And please, uh, please pray for Steve uh, that he'll bounce back 100%. And, uh, and be well and, and able to um, uh, serve the Lord here uh, as soon as possible. So uh, again, we, uh, we have much to be in prayer about this week. Well, this morning, the subject that we're dealing with in our study on the attributes of God is the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God. When we think of the righteousness of God, oftentimes it becomes entangled with the holiness of God. In fact, it's sometimes difficult to to separate them and, and understand what exactly is meant by the righteousness of God. We think of the word righteous, we think how it's used in our culture. Um, I think of the, the righteous brothers. Is that going back a ways? Maybe more uh, recent than the righteous brothers was the vernacular when we used to call certain people righteous. Do you remember that? Oh, he's, he's righteous. Well, I looked up, you know, what the definition of a righteous dude is. Do you remember Ferris Bueller's day off, you know? And, well, the so-and-so's like him, the so-and-so's like him, the so-and-so like him. And the secretary says, he's a righteous dude. Well, I looked up, righteous dude. It's an awesome guy who's very much fun to be around. And he's usually associated with surfers. Everyone, it said, loves a righteous dude. He's an all-around, outgoing guy. And the vernacular in the application would be something like this. Whoa, bro, did you see Joe ride that wave? Yeah, man, he's such a righteous dude. <laughs> well, you can kind of throw that out the window this morning. We'll talk about being a righteous dude, but it doesn't have to do with surfing. Although I loved to surf back in the day, it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do, however, with the character of God. When we talk about the essence of God, we talk about what makes God, God. And one of the aspects that's so important when we think about God and, and who he is and what constitutes being God is the fact that God alone is righteous. Now, for us to really comprehend righteousness, if we look at the terminology that's actually used, um, the most common Old Testament word that's translated righteous would be the idea of being straight. And uh, in the New Testament, it kind of means equal. And it, either one of them really does mean they do what is right or a person who does what is right. Fascinating enough, when you go to the Old Testament, New Testament, Septuagint, you'll all find the similar word used for the word righteous and the word just. The two are interchangeable. There's really nothing that separates them. They're identical terms. And so sometimes when we, when we look at that word and we see the word just there, it doesn't really uh, strike us how it should be translated one way one time and another word another time. But understand this, that God's righteousness or God's justice is really the natural expression of God's holiness. If he's infinitely pure, he must be opposed to all sin. The opposition to sin must be demonstrated in his treatment of his creation. When we think of God being righteous, what we're saying is that God always, always, always does the right thing. He is just. Everything that he does is right. Let's pray. Shall we ask God to bless the word this morning? Father, we thank you that truly there is only one who is just. Father, we understand and know that we are not just. 
we don't always do the right thing. Father, as much as our intentions may be good and, and, and well, we find ourselves falling short. Just as the scripture says, for all have come short to the glory of God. Part of your glory is your awesome rightness, your justness. Help us, Lord, to comprehend this reality as we study the scriptures this morning. And help us to understand, Lord, how we must be just in order to gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Pray these blessings on your scripture, Lord, today and upon the hearts and hearers this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. A.W. Tozer had a great quote when he started to talk here about the righteousness of God. He says this, it's sometimes said justice requires God to do a certain thing, to do this, referring to some act we know he will perform. This is actually an error of thinking as well as of speaking, for it postulates a principle of justice that's outside of God, which compels him to act in a certain way. Of course, there is no such principle. If there were, it would be superior to God, for only a superior power can compel obedience. The truth is, there is not and ever can be anything outside the nature of God which can move him in the least degree. All God's reasons come from within his uncreated being. Nothing has entered the being of God from eternity. Nothing has been removed and nothing's been changed. So when we understand that God is righteous, God's righteousness is part of who he is. And God answers to absolutely no other higher power. You might hear people say, and maybe you've said it yourself, we're all tempted at different times to say it, well, God is going to have to do such and such. Have you ever heard yourself say that or heard somebody else say it? Well, if, you know, if this sin persists, God is absolutely going to have to judge this particular sin. And Tozer's point is that nothing compels God to do anything. God is God, and he'll do the right thing all of the time. And our understanding of God, frankly, is pretty limited. When God acts justly, he's not doing so to conform to an independent criterion, but he's simply acting like himself in every single situation. And so the following statement's absolutely true. God's not defined by the term righteous as much as the term righteous is defined by God. God is not measured by the standard of righteousness. God sets the standard of righteousness. And there's a difference between the two. I take your, um, take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to the first book of the Bible in Genesis chapter 18. And I'd like to just take a moment to illustrate here in this passage, a passage that no doubt bears some familiarity for all of us. It's a passage of Scripture where we find God's interaction with Abraham over the pending destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah is about ready to be destroyed. And the passage is very curious in many ways. But here, God asks the question in verse 17. The Lord sh said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. For I've chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him, to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. Ah, that's pretty interesting, isn't it? That verse of scripture talks about the reality of what God was going to do with Abraham. He wants Abraham to be known by righteousness and as well by justice. Now, it's fascinating to me that God is asking this question in verse 17. Hmm, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? All of this is written for us to be able to gain some information about God from. And we need to understand it that particular way. You see, God says in verse 29, And the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great indeed, 
and their sin is exceedingly grave. I will go down now and see if they have done entirely according to its outcry, which has come to me, and if not, I'll know. Now, what I say about this passage is it's an interesting passage because here you have God saying, I've heard this outcry from down there in Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, you can ask yourself the question, well, where did God hear the outcry? Who did it come from? Well, it probably came from Lot, whose soul was being vexed, the Bible says, every single day. But does God really need to go down to check this out? It's my understanding that God is all wise and knowing, that he's sovereign, that he understands these things, that he's omniscient and omnipresent. Can you explain to me then why God says, I need to go down and check out this situation and see if Lot's outcry is really true? Why does he do that? Why does he say that? Well, it's written so that, again, we might gain some understanding here. Well, the idea is that God goes down and he checks it out. And sure enough, it's as bad as Lot said, or whoever made the outcry, it's definitely bad. And so God determines in his heart that he is going to act and he's going to destroy this. Now, this was never a question. Actually, verse 17 says, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? It was absolutely firmly entrenched. I mean, God is going to take this action. But prior to taking this action, he's going to demonstrate to Abraham and through his word demonstrate to us that he is going to go down and check this out. Remember, we're talking about the righteousness of God. We're talking about whether or not God is just in all the things that he does. You've got this very unique conversation in verse 22 where the men turned away from there, went towards Sodom while Abraham was still standing before the Lord. And Abraham turns to the Lord. Notice that he comes near and he says, Lord, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Whew. Interesting question to ask God. God, you're about to destroy it. You've checked it out, and sure enough, the things down there that you're hearing about are true. But are you going to destroy them all if there's some righteous there? Are you going to destroy the righteous along with the wicked? How many of you here believe that God is righteous and just? I'll assume all of you believe that, though some may not. But I'm going to assume for this that you're in agreement with God is righteous and God is just. I'm not sure Abraham believes it at this point. He wants to know, God, if you're going to go down there and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, are you really going to blow this place up? If there are 50 righteous people, what about those 50 righteous people? That's what he's asking, is he not? You're really going to destroy these 50 along with the terrible, wicked people? In in Abraham's mind, what's he saying? I fully understand, God, why you're blowing up the wicked, but I'm fully not understanding why these righteous people should be included. At this point in time, Abraham is questioning the justness of God. Is he not? So he goes and he asks that question of God, will you indeed sweep away these righteous? And suppose he says there's 50 within the city, will you sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50? Oh, so now the question is, will you destroy the righteous? And now it's, will you destroy the whole city? If there's 50 there, maybe it's not worthy of being destroyed. He's calling into question the the mind and the actions of God. But then he states this in verse 25, far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. You see, Abraham is interjecting a criterion, and the criteria would be, God, you can judge them based on this criteria, but not on other criteria. And so he's again putting some outward force in play that's actually superior to God. Far be it from you, he exclaims. He says, shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? And that's the question. That's the question in his mind. And so the Lord said, if I find 50 righteous within the city, I'll spare the whole place. And Abraham replies and he says, 
as he's thinking about it, he's probably thinking to himself, hmm, I'm not sure there's 50. <laughs> and he says, I, I, I ventured to speak to the Lord, although I'm but dust and ashes. Suppose the 50 are lacking five. Will you destroy the whole city because of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find 45. And they play this game and they start going back and forth over whether or not there's a significant number of righteous people in the city. And by the time you get down towards the end, God is saying, listen, uh, I will not destroy it on account of 10. But God knew all along that there weren't even 10. Lot and his family would have the opportunity to escape the judgment of God, it is true, but why is this written in Scripture? Why is this dialogue placed here in chapter 18? Well, I believe that what God was doing was he was showing forth to Abraham that he is just. I've decided that this is what I'm going to do, and there is good reason for it. And Abraham protests, and he wants to know, well, God, will, will you still do it if this is the case and that's the case? And they go back and forth, and God says, even if you can find me 10, then I won't destroy it. But the point was, it was worthy of destruction in the mind of God. And what God had to do was he had to point that out to Abraham. Now, he does all of that, and he does it for a reason, and the reason is that the future great nation that God was going to make from Abraham's seed was to demonstrate righteousness, and you can see from the screen behind me, righteousness and justice. Abraham, you're being called upon to demonstrate this type of lifestyle before the world. You're going to need to be righteous. You're going to need to be just. So God has a purpose, and God has a plan for all of these things. Do you believe that God is indeed righteous and just? Do you believe his way is the best way? Do you believe that there's absolute sense to trust the Lord? Well, I believe that that's absolutely certain. And I believe that it's very important, especially when we come to the doctrine of salvation. Now, again, the two words are closely connected, righteousness and justness. And what's the New Testament doctrine that's so important? I'll talk about it here in a moment. Well, it's justification. How does one become justified? You see, that's a great question. If there is only one who is just, then his justness has to transfer from him to all of us. Are you with me? Right? I mean, it has to come from him. There's only one place that you can find justness. And that's God. And so only he can justify another. You can't justify me. I can't justify you. Because I have a sin problem and you have a sin problem. We both have problems, don't we? Sure we do. And the Bible is very clear about this difficulty that we all face. Now, when you come to the subject of righteousness and the righteousness of God in the New Testament... The first thing that really stands out is the fact that, that the people during the New Testament time of Jesus thought that they were already righteous. Uh, they would have argued with us to the cows come home, so to speak, because they believed that they were fully righteous just the way they stood. Now take your Bible, go with me over to Romans chapter 3, if you would, be so kind. Romans chapter 3. For the Bible says in Romans 3 and verse 10, there is how many righteous? There's none. There's none righteous. Not even one. That's why we weren't surprised when Steve said, I'm not righteous. Well, none of us are righteous. Not, not one single one of us. He goes on and he says, there's none who understands. There's none who seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They have become useless and he goes on and he, he quotes the old testament we have this problem you see and it's a huge problem in jesus's day for jesus begins to 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 make statements as he teaches he'll say things like you have heard it said or he, or but i say to you and Jesus is challenging the thinking of the day because of the difficult scenario that he's facing 
think of these New Testament uh, verses of Scripture. I mean, these are, these are great ways to point out the fact that, well, you really aren't all okay. Jesus says, uh, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is how you get into the kingdom of heaven. You need to be perfect. How many of you are perfect? In light of Romans 3.10 that we just got through reading, there is none righteous, and that includes me and it includes you. So none of us are perfect. So I read that verse that Jesus uh, spoke, and, and I'm in a world of hurt, right? I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm in a bad place when I read that. Roman, uh, Matthew 5.20 says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, Jesus is extremely clear, isn't he? When it comes to the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, they were the ones who were setting the standard for righteousness in that society. If you wanted to know what righteousness looked like, you looked at the scribes and Pharisees. First of all, they knew all the rules. They had the rule book. You didn't even have the rule book. How are you going to win if you don't have the rule book? I mean, seriously, I mean, you're out there playing the game, but you only know what they tell you. And they've got all the rules. And there's a whole bunch more rules than you even knew existed. But they've got all those rules, and these were the people who were tremendously esteemed in that society. So when Jesus comes down and he makes these statements, I want you to know that he is coming head to head with these leaders. You see, their problem was self-righteousness. There was an external standard that they built up for themselves, and they thought that if I just follow that external standard, I will be fine. And so they became the standard of righteousness in that society. You gotta love Matthew 22, 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And a little later in there, he says, you will love your neighbor as yourself. There's nobody here that does that. <laughs> okay. You don't. I don't. I wish I did. I can pretend that I do. Do I love the Lord? Yes. Do I love him with all of my heart? At times. Do I love him with all of my soul? I don't even know what that means. Do I love him with all of my mind? Definitely not. Do I love him... And do I love my neighbor like I love myself? Without question, I don't. We, we should be honest once in a while, right? I mean, that's just... <laughs> Monday through Saturday, you can live like you're whatever. But Sunday, we need to be honest, right? It, this is a problem for us. This is an enormous problem for us. And in the problem all comes from the fact that we are sinful. We have a dilemma that we face. Isaiah describes it for all of us to become uh, like one who is unclean. And all of our righteousness, uh, all of our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. And all of us wither like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. All we like sheep have gone astray, have we not? You see, we have a sin dilemma uh, that we face. And the question then uh, is an important question. We find ourselves uh, oftentimes trying to figure out what do we do? What do, what do we do now? Jesus is going to address those religious leaders in the strongest terminology. If you think to yourself, I can somehow obtain righteousness or justness on my own, understand once again that the justified, that is God himself, is the only one who can justify you. No one from the outside can justify you, and you can't justify yourself. I think probably the number one thought process in the minds of of people in the world is that they can somehow justify themselves. If you look at Matthew chapter 23, you'll see the strongest of words from Jesus to the Pharisees and the, and the scribes. Matthew 23, verse 28, it says, even so too, outwardly, 
appear righteous to men. Even so you too, he says. You appear outwardly righteous to men. But inwardly, he says, you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Wow. You might be right in the head, and you might not, but you might be right in the head, but what you need to be is right in the heart. You see, all of the, the mental gymnastics that the scribes and the Pharisees were doing and all of the external standards that they, they spent hours and days and years developing didn't matter. What God wants is us to be right in the heart. We can look good on the outside. There's not one of us here that can't put on a show for all to see. But what is in our hearts? That's the question. And God goes on and he says here, he says, but inwardly you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Can you imagine the standards of righteousness in that society being challenged by these words when Jesus looks at them and says, you're a bunch of hypocrites and you're lawbreakers. Lawbreakers, we're law writers. Whew. Now, it's easy for us living you know, near Washington with Congress and everything probably to understand that. Um, but in Jesus' day, it was somewhat revolutionary, this, this statement. And then Jesus goes on in verse 29 and he says, Woe to you. Whenever you see the word woe, you should say woe. <laughs> like not W-O-E, you should say W-H-O-A, like how to stop a horse. You should say woe. There's a woe. woe. Because woe is very important. If it's there in the Bible, there is something coming that is very significant. Jesus is making a giant statement. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets, ordain, adorn the mo monuments of the righteous, and say, if we'd been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partners with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Oh, yeah? Notice, notice what Jesus says. Consequently, he says, you bear witness against yourselves, that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up, then, the measure of the guilt of your fathers. You serpents, whew, he's calling them serpents, yikes. You brood of vipers. Mm, no, nah, we're not even talking a singular snake. I hate snakes. I, I don't like singular snakes. You talk about a whole brood of them, that's bad news. That's, that's time for a grenade. And he, he goes on, he says, how shall you escape the sentence of hell? Therefore, behold, I'm sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you'll kill and crucify. Who's he talking about? Number one, he's talking about himself. And some of them you'll scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. You see, these people were guilty of being externally righteous, but there wasn't the righteousness in their heart. Jesus is teaching on the Sermon of the Mount. He warns against this type of externalism and, and all the ceremony and all of the pomp and circumcision. And so there's all of this, you know, stuff. You got it. <laughs> I'm just seeing if you're awake. <laughs> all of these, and it's true, if you stop and think about it. All of that stuff was all external. And this is how the people lived. This is how the, 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 the people developed their standards of righteousness. And so for us today, a similar way of thinking really does exist. How in the world can we become righteous? Well, this really brings us uh, to some important scripture. I think of Romans chapter 3 in verse 21. It says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all those who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. You and I have a sin problem. Our sin problem comes to us in the doctrine, and, and let me throw out a theological term, it's the doctrine of imputation, whereby we are imputed sin. At the moment of conception, as soon as we enter this world, we have a sin nature. And in our account is this negative, this deficit called sin. Now, if you look at this definition of imputation, this is going to pertain to righteousness, but the same thing is true when it comes to, to our sinfulness. To impute something is to ascribe or to attribute something to someone. 
Uh, when we place faith in Jesus Christ, God ascribes the perfect righteousness of Christ to our account. But we have received through the penalty of sin. Notice Romans 3.23 there in that same text. And this is something we've, we've talked about uh, a couple of times fairly recent. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin, verse 28, is going to tell us that we're in pretty significant uh, deficit area. We maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works. That is true. So what we realize is that we have this tremendous problem. We have a negative in our account, and we need righteousness. Now, God, who is righteous, he always does the right thing, says the wages of sin is death, but what? The gift of God is eternal life, 623, Romans. You look at that verse of Scripture, and you realize that it's always true. It's always true, is it not? The wages of sin is death sometimes, right? No, it's, it, it's, there are people, believe it or not, and I'm not trying to offend anyone, but there are people who literally believe that after they die and they go to heaven or they stand before God as an unbelieving person here on the earth, that God is somehow going to just change his mind. Yeah, you know what? <sighs> On second thought, you can all come to heaven. I mean, there, I've met people like that. Uh, that's what people, you know, what are you hoping for? Well, I'm just hoping that God goes easy on me. The problem is God has already stated in his word. The revelation that he has given says that the wages of sin is death. And what that means is God isn't going to change his mind. The wages of sin is death. And we're saying that the wages of sin is always, always death. But you say, well, wait a minute, Pastor Kevin. We have Jesus. Yeah. And what did Jesus do when he came? He died, didn't he? Perfect. God himself went to the cross and died. You know why Jesus went to the cross and died? Because the wages of sin is death. And he took upon himself the sins of the whole world. That's why Jesus did that. Which makes it possible for God to impute righteousness. If Jesus Christ had never come and died and paid the penalty for sin, you and I could never be justified. You see, that doctrine never changes. The reality is the wages of sin is death. It was, it was true in Genesis, it's true in Matthew, and it's true in Revelation, and it's true today. The wages of sin is always death. So who's going to pay for your sin? Who's going to pay? Are you going to spend eternity in hell because of it? I love the doctrine of justification. I think it's an awesome, awesome doctrine. When you stop and you think about justification, what is meant by justification is that God declares the sinner to be no longer exposed to the penalty of the law, which is death, but to be restored to God's favor. God is satisfied by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And all those who will come to him in faith will be declared justified, declared righteous. When I'm up in heaven, I'll be there not because I'm righteous on my own. I'll be there because I am declared righteous because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I am clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Romans 3.20 says, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Can't do it by working on my own. Romans 3.24, being justified is a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. That's the only way. 
Romans 3, 28, for we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works. Romans 4, 2 talks about Abraham, and it says even Abraham is justified by, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. You see, he was justified, it says in chapter 4, by faith. Romans 5, 1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 9, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. God is just in giving to us salvation through Jesus Christ. He is fully justified. All of the doctrine is there. Our God can impute righteousness to those who come to him in faith. And beyond this, because of the scope and the magnitude of what Jesus Christ has done, I believe God extends grace for salvation even to those who never have the mental capacity to be able to express that faith. I believe children, babies, when they're born, if they die without, without uh, the opportunity to grow up and hear the gospel, Jesus can save them and will save them. He can do all of those things. You say, well, why is that so important, Kevin? Why is it so important? It's important because the only way salvation can be extended to this world, to you and to me, is if it fits with all the doctrine of Scripture and fits within the understanding of our righteous God. And the great news that I have for you this morning is it violates absolutely nothing in the scriptures for a person to gain entrance, born a sinner with a sin nature, to go to heaven after they die because of faith in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. God is just. God is righteous. But he is also merciful. And for that, we can be so, so thankful. Amen. If you're here this morning and you have questions about placing your faith in something, let me just urge you to understand that faith in your works is not going to take you where you want to go. Only faith in Jesus Christ saves. And if you've yet to place your faith in Jesus Christ, you are on a very dangerous pathway. Get off that dangerous pathway. Know that your sins have been forgiven. Know that you will stand before a holy, righteous God someday. Not clothed in your own righteousness. For if you step into the presence of Almighty God with all the good things you think you've done, you are in a world of hurt and hell awaits. You must stand before Jesus, wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus Christ that is yours clearly in the scripture. It's yours through personal faith in Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? We don't work for our eternal life. Uh, We don't have to be smart. We don't have to be rich. We don't have to be any of those things. We can simply put faith in Jesus Christ and have our sins forgiven. When we get to heaven, heaven will be a wonderful place. Everyone walking there will be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. How wonderful that truly is. Let's pray, shall we? You're here this morning and Maybe this has been a subject that's kind of been been rattling around inside your mind. You've not been at peace, perhaps, over where you're going to spend eternity. You're trying to make sense of life. Nothing seems to satisfy you, and you're just unsettled. And now you've heard that faith in Christ makes all the difference. I wonder this morning if I can lift you up in prayer. I won't mention your name or anything, embarrass you in any way, but if I could just in general pray for you, I'd be happy to do so. You're here this morning and say, Pastor Kevin, please remember me in prayer. God is at work in my heart. God is at work in my heart today. Is there anyone? Just slip up your hand with our heads bowed. God's at work. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God who is rich in mercy desires that all will come to faith in Christ. Let's all stand, shall we? Have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you and we praise you today for the work that was done on our behalf. The work of Christ on the cross. Before it, Lord, we know that no flesh would be justified. But after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, 
all those who have faith in Christ, will be rewarded eternal life and the joys of living life now with a purpose and a meaning. Work in these hearts, Lord, I pray today. Finish the work that you've started in all of our hearts and minds that we might be your children bringing you glory. And help us, Father, as we walk from this place into the marketplace to bear the testimony of Jesus Christ to all in a way that would bring them to Christ, that they might partake in the joys of what you have prepared. Pray this all now in Christ's precious name. And again, Lord, just before I close, I lift up Brother Steve today. Continue to pray for him. Pray the doctors would have wisdom and know how to treat him exactly as it's needed. And Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ who will be journeying on to Nicaragua on Tuesday. Father, give them safety and a, a wonderful time. May they, they know that they are doing a vital work in your kingdom. And Father, may you bless their hand, I pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. God bless you.